Well, normally I'm quite clueless when it comes to the news. I I rely on my relationships with others to know what's going on in the world. But then there are some that you just cannot escape, even if you don't really watch TV or you don't watch the news at night. One of those may be the Brian Williams story and everything that's taking place with the NBC nightly news. Uh, There's a new face that has been filling in. And I, I read a couple of different articles about this whole thing with Brian Williams, because to me it just seems like, well, what does it matter if someone isn't completely honest when they're reporting the news, right? I was told not to believe anything that I saw on TV anyway, so shouldn't I just expect that maybe some things will be a little bit tweaked? Uh, But I was reading some different articles, and, and I came across this one that I just wanted to start with and share with you. And it's talking about whether or not Brian Williams is gonna return, and should he return, what's gonna happen, or if he doesn't, who's gonna take his place? So here it says, should Williams somehow fail to pass muster in the probe and be judged damaged goods, Holt, who like Williams is 55, is in line to replace him, at least temporarily. Holt, who anchors the nightly news and the Today Show on weekends, as well as the weekly magazine show Dateline NBC, has solid journalistic chops and, unlike Williams, who is seen internally at NBC as a remote insular figure, I've never even used that word before, is widely liked, to, or widely liked by colleagues. He's also African-American, and he'd be a home run in terms of diversity, says the NBC News veteran. I think the senior executives have always underestimated him. Now, I read a bunch of different articles. This was the first one that I saw that drew attention to this one line that said, he is also African-American. He'd be a home run in terms of diversity. Now, there has been a large push now for many years for diversification. And a lot of that makes sense because our world is not as it used to be. Our country is not as it used to be. It is a very diverse country. And when you go into large cities, it almost doesn't look like it's just one nationality or even if this is America anymore, right? I mean, it is so diversified and it can't be ignored. And so a lot of companies, a lot of organizations have really made this push to diversify. And it makes a lot of sense, actually. And some do it because it's politically correct. Some do it for actually a political gain. Some do it because it's a great business move. And if you really want to reach a larger number of people, then you have to diversify. But then there are some that we hope would do it just out of the conviction of their hearts. Some that we would hope would do it because of the reconciliation that will take place between ethnicities or cultures. And some, we just want to do it because it it is the right thing to do. We're going to look at a, a church today, actually, that was brought together by the Spirit and really didn't have a choice in this matter. It was going to happen. And churches, churches have been facing this issue really on on whether or not they're going to diversify and how they're going to do it really ever since Martin Luther King Jr. said that the most segregated hour in America is at 11 o'clock on Sunday mornings. And at that point, 97% of churches in America were predominantly one ethnicity. And when they say predominantly, the number that they used was 80%. So anything greater than 80%, they would say was predominantly one ethnicity. 97% of churches at that time. Today, that number has dropped and it is now 87%. So there has been a movement towards greater diversification even in the church. But I want you to look uh, with me, well, I guess in a moment, Um, I think one of the reasons for this, if you can put that slide up there, I think one of the reasons for this is we see, we see things like this. This actually comes from one of the leading churches and they're talking about reaching people. We're in our series right now on reaching and using the gospel to reach. And this, this was their model that they used, a predominant church with a very, very prominent pastor um, that I would guess every single one of you in this church knows. His name is not Brian or Jeff. Um, but they use this model when they're trying to reach people. And so it's hard to see what's going on around him, but there's words like, 
He is well-educated. He likes his job. He likes where he lives. Health and fitness are high priorities to him and his family. He likes contemporary music. He likes enjoying more... He likes enjoying life more than he did five years ago. Uh, He has overextended both time and money. They have a bunch of these different things. And you can tell just by looking at him, he is a very specific type of person, right? Very specific. And the reason this would happen is because this makes it a lot easier to identify yourself as a church. You go after one person, you have a target person, you can then say, this is the style of music we're going to have. This is the style of services that we're going to have. These are the types of ministries that we're going to have in our church. And this is the social gatherings that we're going to provide. And this is what Sunday morning will look like because we have an identity. So they'll use something like this as a model so that they have a target person so they know exactly who they're going after in an effort to build, to reach. And this was their model person. So now... You can turn with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 13. And we're going to look at a church that I said it did things a little bit differently because it was literally brought together by the Spirit. We're going to begin in Acts chapter 13, and we'll start with verse 1. To set this up, we've been going through our series in Acts, and right now we're in the middle of reaching. But we've watched as the church in Jerusalem came together, and it was founded on the person and the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. And this foundation then was laid by the apostles, the founding fathers of that church in Jerusalem. And we watched as the power of the Holy Spirit came and it was doing some incredible things through the area and through the church. And we watched then as this church took a huge risk and they planted another church in Antioch, a very pluralistic uh, society religiously, Um, very multicultural um, city that this was in. It would probably be the same as uh, a New York or a Chicago. It was very diversified. It was the third largest city in the Roman Empire. And the church in Jerusalem planted a church there. And this is what we learn about this church in Antioch. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, a lifelong friend of Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. So I don't normally spend a ton of time just on people, because really this is not about people. And this whole series, this whole study, we have been watching this movement, this movement that is the Holy Spirit that is sweeping through this area and sweeping through and transforming lives. And the Holy Spirit is at work. But I want to focus on these gentlemen for one reason, because I said this was a very multicultural city that this church was planted in. And so to do this correctly, for this to be sustainable, they had to have a very multicultural leadership in this church. So here we see first Barnabas. Barnabas was a Jew from Cyprus who was formerly known as Joseph. You may remember from Acts chapter four, there was a man who came before the apostles. He had just sold a field. He brought all the money with him and he laid everything down at the apostles' feet. Now this was not Ananias and Sapphira who lied to the apostles and lied to the Holy Spirit and were then killed on the spot. That was chapter five. This is chapter four. This is the man who did it right. He was extremely generous in his giving. His name was Joseph, Later, the apostles give him the name Barnabas because Barnabas was such an encouraging person. Like if we were to do a spiritual gift test for Barnabas, he was the encourager and his name meant son of encouragement. So he was extremely generous in his giving. He was the most encouraging person you would ever come across, right, in church. Always encourage you, always push you to move forward. This was Barnabas. This is how they describe Barnabas, though. He was a man, a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, right? That'd be awesome to have someone say that about you. This man, then Barnabas, went to Saul in Tarsus and got him and said, hey, there's this church thing that's happening in Antioch. You and me, we're going to go. We're going to be the beginners in this. We're going to get this thing going. And they ended up being there for a year. This is where we find ourselves now. It's a year later after that happened. One biblical scholar, this was like 200 years ago. This is what he said of Barnabas. He said, Barnabas 
was an earthly representation of the Holy Spirit. This is who Barnabas was. So this man was a part of the church. Then there was Lucius. Lucius was a Christian from Cyrene, which is in Africa. It was probably an Arab country that he was from. We don't have a lot about him. So then we have Niger. His name was Simeon, but no one called him Simeon. They called him Niger. Why? Because, because he was black. Not politically correct right now, that's for sure. This is what they called him. This, is, this was Niger. He was a part of the church. Here we have Menaean then, a lifelong friend of Herod. This is the Herod that went and beheaded John the Baptist, this guy. He was married to his stepbrother's wife. Jesus referred to him as that fox. And then God struck him down. This is the guy that we read about. He took all the praise when people said, this man is a God. He is not speaking the words of God. He is a God. And he's taking this in and he's like, yes, I'm God. And then God struck him down. Then he got eaten by worms and his life was over. Right? Menaean was like his best friend, grew up with him. And then we have Saul, a native of Tarsus, whose father was Roman. He was a tent maker by trade. He was raised in the Pharisee schools. And he was even taught then by one of the greatest Greek philosophers, Gamaliel. He persecuted Christians as a Jewish Pharisee. Then he became one of those Christians that he persecuted. And his only desire in life was to do the will of the one who sent him. So I bring this out because this was a very diverse leadership, very multicultural. And they did this not only because it was necessary but they did this because they knew if they were diversified in this way, they could reach the largest amount of people in this city, Antioch, where they had planted this church. So they brought these men together. They are the leaders. And we have Menaean who's going to be reaching out to those that are in political power, those of great wealth. We have uh, a man in Niger that is going to be able to relate really to anyone that is of any color that might be viewed as um, someone that's maybe not necessarily fitting in right there. We have a man in uh, Lucius who can really relate to anyone that is an immigrant coming in to the area. We have a man in um, Barnabas who, well, I mean, he's an earthly representation of the Holy Spirit, so who's he not going to reach, right? But he can relate to any normal guy that may be just Jewish in that area. And then we have another man, Saul, who has been all over the spectrum, even to the point of killing people. But he can go into the synagogues. He can go and he can talk with any of the leaders, the religious leaders that are there. This man can reach people that others will not be able to. Each one of them, we're going to be able to reach a very specific group. Now, for some reason, they decided not to say, well, why don't you go start a church here and you can have people like you and you go start a church over there and you can have people like you and you go start a church here and you can have people like you and then maybe we'll be able to reach everyone through our churches. They instead, they came together, brought together by the Holy Spirit and they said, we're gonna do this together and we're gonna reach as many people as we can in this area together. So they were brought together by the Spirit. This to me is probably one of the greatest miracles of the gospel. And this to me is, I think, an incredible sign of the reconciliation that takes place between us and God. And anyone that would have walked through those doors at that church would have seen that because there was no organization at that time that was doing things that way. And there would never be an organization that would set up their leadership in that way. It was completely different when you walked through those doors. They had a visible representation of this gospel message. So continuing on with where we're reading. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Now it appears that they may have gathered at this point for a very specific reason. And the reason being is that they're not only coming together and worshiping, which is what we do on a weekly basis, they're coming together and they're in the middle of a fast. I don't know how long this fast has been going, but because they're in the middle of a fast, it probably means that they are coming before the Lord with some kind of request. Now, when I was preparing uh, this week, I went to a coffee shop. 
I think the caffeine there makes me feel so much closer to God. It's so much easier to study. So I'm in the middle of this coffee shop and I'm reading and I'm working and in comes this lady with ashes on her forehead. This Wednesday was, was Ash Wednesday. And she had come into the coffee shop and she had this cross on her forehead put on there with ashes. And this is something that many Lutherans, Catholics, and, and some Protestants as well will do during these 40 days leading up to Easter. And generally, anyone that goes uh, on Ash Wednesday especially, they're going to be saying, I'm going to set something apart in my life. I am going to fast from something. And some, it may be meat on Friday. Some may choose to do uh, something else in their fast. But really the whole reason for a fast is that the people that are doing this, or it should be, at the heart of what a fast is, is they are saying, I want a piece of my flesh to die. I want my spirit to live and I want a part of my flesh to die. Whatever it may be, a desire that I have, something that I know that is not good for me, something that has become a distraction in my life, I want to separate myself from that because I don't want any distraction as I am going before the Lord at this time because there is something very specific that I'm praying about. Now, some, some will think, well, you fast because you want to show God just how serious you are about this matter, that this is not a joking matter. You're being serious about this. But in all honesty, we don't have to prove that to God. And in all honesty, there is nothing that we could possibly want that is at the heart of God that he doesn't want way more than we want, right? It's not us that has to change God's mind or his heart, it's God that has to change our hearts. So when we come before the Lord in a fast, we're not doing it to show him just how serious we are. We are saying, God, I'm in prayer about this and I don't know what you're gonna ask me to do. I don't know what you want done with this, but I'm coming before you and I'm setting aside any distraction that I think may come between me and you and me understanding your word in my life. And I'm gonna come before you completely open listening as best as I can. This is what the church is doing at this time. They have come together as a church and each person is fasting. It's not just the leaders. And each person has come before the Lord with this attitude and this heart of worship. And it's not just the leaders that are doing this. They're coming before the Lord, they're coming in prayer and they're coming in worship. Now here's, here's something that we can all learn, I think, about worship. From this passage, if we truly want to hear from the Lord, it's got to come out of an attitude and a heart of worship. And it probably will come the easiest to hear God when we are in those moments of worshiping. Because in those moments and in those times of worship, our focus is not on ourselves. Our focus is on God and God alone. And for these people, it was only enhanced then by the fast that they were participating in. And it's only in those times of worship that we can really not only hear from God, but it's in those times of worship that God actually transforms our hearts and he makes his desires our desires. It's in those moments that transformation and life change happens in us. And it is in this moment of the church, in a very critical time for this church, they've come before the Lord in prayer in fasting, and in worship, and they have come together because every single one of them wants to hear from the Lord. And I think it is important that every single one of them is hearing from the Lord in this moment because these are the times what we read about in this passage. These are the times where we will either see a church, especially a church that has every single reason to divide, right? When you bring many cultures together. There are so many reasons for why this church can and should and probably would divide. And the only thing holding them together is the Holy Spirit. But let's be honest, for each one of us, it probably is the same thing, right? The only thing that can truly bring us together and unite us is the Holy Spirit. And for this church, for this church, they are either at a moment right now where they will be strengthened at a moment where they will be brought even closer together and united on this front 
or they're going to completely be destroyed and devoured. I want you to imagine, just, just think about this scene in this church for a moment. They have the leaders that are up, and they are in a time of prayer and worship and fasting, saying, Lord, we feel as if you're wanting some of us to go. What is it that you would want? I love that their attitudes in this are not, hey, God, we have a, a few things here that we want you to choose from, and you can tell us what it is that you want. Really, they have come, they're like, Lord, we don't know who you're going to call. We don't know exactly what you're going to do. We're just here, and whatever it is that you want, we're going to be okay with that. So you can just go right ahead and tell us what you want, and we will do it. What they have done is they have offered their best and their brightest. They have offered their teachers. They have offered their leaders. They have offered the ones that have built the church, the foundation that it was on. And they are saying, we are willing even to send those. Now imagine if someone missed out on that service, right? And they come back the next gathering, and they're like, wait a minute. Where's Paul and Barnabas? Why aren't they here? Who's that dude teaching up there? Why, why isn't Paul preaching? Why isn't Barnabas preaching? And someone were to say, oh, oh, actually, they're gone. Yeah, we sent them out last week. You missed it. It was a great time. Or casually in conversation, if this were today, meeting up with a friend. So how church go this week? Oh, it was great. Well, let me just tell you, Pastor Jeff and Pastor Brian, they're gone. What? Right? If we're not there, if we're not actively taking part in this, our emotions can take over, our opinions can take over, our thoughts can take over, and sometimes our thoughts are not exactly what God's thoughts are. Now, I've come to realize that um, over my lifetime so far. Sometimes his desires are not necessarily our desires. And if we aren't there in those moments, in these times of worship, where we too can hear from the Lord, not only to affirm and confirm those that are saying, this is what I believe the Lord is calling me to do, but as a church, they can come together and say, yes, so do we, and we are on board with this, and we are going to send you, and we are going to support you, and we are actively going to take part in this because we are being led together, right? Those are the moments where a church is strengthened, when the church is led together as a body, as a unit, and not as certain people just saying, this is what we're doing, get on board. When the church unites as a body, this is where we see health taking place in the church. And this is what's going on in this church, and it is a beautiful thing that we watch happening at the church in Antioch. So let's continue reading. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had John to assist them. This was John Mark, who wrote the Gospel Mark. So after coming together... After receiving this word from the Lord as a church together, in the act of worship together, they now send together Paul and Barnabas. And I put a map up here. I don't know if you're going to be able to see it. Hopefully it provides a little help for you. This was the route that they took. So they went from Antioch to this other uh, port, this other town port that was right, right on the edge of the water there. So they're sending from there in Seleucia down to um, Solomus in Cyprus. That's the first little boat ride that they're taking as they're sailing. And then they move on from there to another town in Cyprus, and then they start heading up. And, and we read about all of this happening throughout the 13th chapter. I'm only going to read five verses because there is way too much to read. But this is the route that it gives us in chapter 13 of Acts that they've taken. And they go up to another city also called Antioch, but not the Antioch where the church was at. This was a new a new Antioch. Hey, I, think, I think it's something like 13 to 15 different cities that they named Antioch in different places. I don't get it. So we're told that they're sent, and they're sent by the Holy Spirit. They're sent together by the church through the Holy Spirit, and they're on this route. And now if, if you're like watching this as I am, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, Holy Spirit showing up, speaking, sending, Obviously, this word is going to be received. Thousands of people are going to come together. They're going to be worshiping the Lord. We're going to see this like total dominance from the Holy Spirit in this area as the word of God is preached and Jesus wins, right? 
And then we see, well, they come to this area and they go and they go into the synagogues, right? They go to Cyprus. Barnabas is from Cyprus. They go into the synagogues because Paul's a, a Pharisee and he knows the ins and outs, the laws. He, he can talk with any, any of them. And so they go into these synagogues, they go into Cyprus and they actually get rejected as they're moving out throughout the land. And it says that they are reviled. It says that they are actually condemned by the Jews who at first like what they're hearing, but then as they are influenced by the Jewish leaders that are there, they are then reviled, or they revile Paul and Barnabas, sorry. And then they go out and they start persecuting Paul and Barnabas. And so we get to a point where we see they are actually kicking out Paul and Barnabas saying, get away from us. We don't want to have anything to do with you. And I ask you, did they fail? Did, did they hear wrong? Did they misunderstand? Did they maybe misinterpret what the Holy Spirit was saying? I think that for many of us, I know this is probably my greatest fear. And I think it's probably true for many of us. Our greatest fear is failure. And I don't know that there is anything that can paralyze us as much as this fear of failure. And when the Holy Spirit will ask us to do something, or we may think that he is kind of nudging our hearts, or he is sending us, or he is asking something from us, for me, my first thought is, but what if I'm wrong? And what if I'm hearing wrong? And what if I fail? Then what? Did they fail? I do want to read one part. This is like the closing argument that Paul and Barnabas make. And this is from Acts 13, 46 to 39. I actually didn't put this on the screen, so I apologize for that. <clears throat> Forty-six to forty-nine, and it says, "Then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly, We had to speak the word of God to you first, and since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles, for this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation." to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord and all who were appointed for eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord spread through the whole region. At first, what appears as failure really turns out to be God saying, this is exactly what I said would happen. You are going to be preaching this good news to the Gentiles, but you had to bring this word to the Jews first, but they have rejected it. And now is your time. You see, there is always a place and there is always a time when it comes to the will of God. And we saw this place happen, and now we're seeing the timing of this. And God is saying, now, now is the time. Now is the time, Paul and Barnabas, where you are taking this gospel message to the Gentiles, and they will gladly receive these words. And the word of God will spread. And church, I say to you, now is our time. And now is our time where we take the word of God, this gospel message, and we take it to those that do not know, those that have not heard. This is our calling. And this is what the Lord requires of us. But we can't miss out on this process. We know this as believers that we are supposed to take the word of God to people, but at times it almost feels like we have to manufacture this. And it's not coming out of a heart of love. And it's not coming out of a heart and a desire of Jesus Christ necessarily. But it's coming out of this knowing that we have to do this. And we've got to come together and we have to come with an art, a heart and an attitude of worship. And we've got to say, Lord, transform my heart because people need to hear this. And God, I need your heart for others because my heart isn't going to do it. 
and I'll come up with reasons why I shouldn't and reasons why I don't need to. But God, if you give me your heart, it's going to be unstoppable because the gospel message is unstoppable. And we're going to watch this in the weeks ahead. This message cannot be stopped. And those Christians that were sent out and were martyred and as others were scattered across the land, the gospel message was not stopped because Jesus Christ was still praised. The message spread because people took the gospel with them as they went. And this is the message for us. Wherever you go, take the gospel with you. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for this gospel message that you have given to us. We thank you so much, Jesus, that you not only require this of us, but that you give us all that we need to be able to take this message. You give us words and you give us hearts for others. And Lord Jesus, I ask that you would do that for us, for each one here as we come together. May we hear from you. May we receive your heart and may we be sent out by you together. I pray this in your name. Amen.